Welcome to the Flower Lounge, a place for conversations with wildly creative people and a little plant-loving wisdom to help you experience life in full bloom. I'm Katie Hess, flower alchemist and founder of Lotus Way, and I believe in a world where we're all living at our personal edge. All right, welcome to today. We have an amazing guest on the show, and that is Jeannie Patel Thompson. I met Jeannie years ago, and she has been such a source of inspiration to me, both in the wellness aspects of my life and in business, and more recently with her work with the horses that I personally got a chance to experience earlier this summer when we were traveling through Vancouver for the Flower Lounge Tour. But I'll let Jeannie get more into that, and let me just share a little bit about Jeannie. She's an internationally recognized expert on national healing for digestive diseases, and her books and products are sold in 60 different countries worldwide. Her success in the health arena has led her to develop a program that teaches others how to build a successful internet-based business. And I'll just add here that I have not seen anyone do it in a more amazing and successful way that I've seen Jeannie and her family do it. Um, And based on their top talent, skill, or field of interest, they help other people do the same. Jeannie's passion now is her herd of five beautiful horses, and she's built a vibrant community of horse listeners who gather together to share knowledge and stories of horses as fully sentient beings. So thanks for being here, Jeannie. Thanks, Katie. Just love you. I love all, any amount of time I can spend with you. <laughs> so I wonder for the people who don't know you already, if you want to just like dial it all the way back to the very beginning, because I think your story is so fascinating. This may seem like a really long time ago to you, but I think the listeners will really get a lot out of your, how you began this whole journey. Mm-hmm. Well, I was diagnosed with widespread Crohn's disease. So that was in my stomach, my small intestine, my large intestine back when I was 16 years old. So I'm going to go, when was that, 1984 maybe? <laughs> um, don't quote me, I'm bad with dates, but somewhere around there. <laughs> and the doctors, the, my doctor who diagnosed me headed up a national research team on Crohn's and colitis. So he was very capable. Uh, And he said to me, you know, based on his experience, he said, you will never be able to have kids. Mm. You will not be able to hold a job. You will be in and out of the hospital for the rest of your life, but at least you'll qualify for disability insurance. So you won't have to worry about surviving financially. And I was actually really grateful that he said that to me, that he was, and he wasn't trying to be a jerk. He was Mm -hmm. actually trying to care for me to say, Mm -hmm. what you have is such a serious manifestation of this disease. People don't come back from this. Like we Mm -hmm. just, we're going to just try to keep you alive, but this Mm -hmm. is what your life is going to look like. So then I could prepare, then I could plan. Um, By that time, I had been in the medical treatment for about three years. I'd done everything he'd said. I was sicker and sicker with every day. I was on 13 pills a day. It was just, I had zero quality of life. Um, And I just looked at him and I went, no, no. So I said, this was before the internet. So he loaded me up with a stack of research reports, um, textbooks, and I took it home and I read everything. And that's when I realized they actually have no idea how to treat these diseases. They don't know what causes them. They're simply trying to keep people alive. And they're just, you know, kind of like, let's try this and see if that works. And let's try that and see if that works. And it was just this real stumbling in the dark kind of testing. And I thought, well, if I'm going to be a guinea pig, I'd rather be my own guinea pig. Uh, Because one thing I knew for sure (laughs) was that when he told me that, I went, I'd rather die. Because I wasn't, even at that age, I was not afraid of death. Hmm. Death to me was like, and at that time I was a Christian. I was an evangelical Christian. I was still in the church and I was like, I get to go to heaven, be with (laughs) Jesus and the angels. Why wouldn't I want that? Why would I stay here? Like, where's the benefit to me then to stay? So I really had nothing to lose. And I said, I am going to heal myself or I'll die trying, but I Mm. won't live like this. Mm. That's not who I am. So that I left the medical treatment protocols. I weaned off all my drugs. Very important in case anybody's listening. If you're on those strong drugs, do not quit them cold turkey. You could cause yourself a very negative health event. You must wean off. 
And then I just started experimenting. And, you know, I lived in Asia for the next two years and then England for the next three years. And so wherever I traveled, I just kind of tried whatever those people did. I had acupuncture at a Zen monastery for six months in Tokyo. I did leaves from the Philippines. I did just kind of anything that anyone had said, oh, this helped so-and-so or because I had no knowledge of herbal medicine. My entire family is uh, doctors and pharmacists. Wow. So yeah, I thought herbal medicine was for third world people who couldn't afford any any drugs. Right? <laughs> like that's how woo. I was just so in the medical pharmaceutical stream at that time. So mm-hmm. having come out of that stream, I just even though I wasn't a science person, I was more of an arts person because I'd grown up with that. I automatically tested every substance a minimum of three times in three Mm. different sets of circumstances so that I could say, okay, so this substance reliably does this effect check. Because the other thing with gut diseases, they are so influenced by stress or diet. You know, Mm -hmm. one bite of a trigger food can cause a flare. So then you you don't know, well, what caused that flare? Was it the substance or was it this food? So you have to test things repeatedly, minimum of three trials in three different circumstances. But what I think is really, really interesting about what you're saying here that I think um, a lot of people around, well, at least in this culture, haven't tuned into yet, which is really important, is that you're talking about self-testing, right? I mean, you're not talking about reading studies or reading journal articles or pharmaceutical publications. You're talking about testing it on your own body, right? Yes, exactly. And and that's very slow, but at the end of the day, and and people, you know, because we get a lot of questions about this allergy test or that allergy test. And I said, at the end of the day, there's nothing more reliable than your own body. So why, but for some reason, people are scared to do that, or they don't think that it's, it's very reliable. They think though, if I go to a, and I get a blood test or saliva and the doctor interprets it for me, that's really reliable. But no, because your body's in this constant state of flux and change. And as we know from the whole epigenetics field, if you change a core belief at the cellular level, you're going to shift. So when you tested this last week, when you believed that life was a struggle and maybe you'd have some intermittent periods of joy, but then you used a really powerful mind-body therapy or maybe you were using your flower essences regularly to change (laughs) your underlying structure. Now you believe, no, life is a series of joys interrupted with some challenges and some hard times that assist me to drill down to uncover more joy. On the surface, those two paradigms look the same, but your cellular reality of living from this space or this space is completely different. And the sense of safety that your body, your adrenals, your thyroid gland feel from living in this place or this place are completely different. Yes. So now when you ingest a substance, your body's going to respond in a completely different way. Mm. So that's where we go, well, the testing and the blah, blah, blah. Yes. Take that information. Take right. it as data. It's, right. I'm not saying throw out everything right. scientific or, right. or every metric that we have. Right. But I'm saying, and that's why the name of my business and my website is called Listen to Your Gut. Because that has to remain the gold standard. That has to remain the pinnacle of pinnacles. That no matter what a doctor says, no matter what a reference or research or clinical trial says, you ask your own gut and you take that as number one above anybody and anything else. Mm. Wow, I love that. And what are some of the things over the years that you've tried that have been non-conventional? Well, pretty much everything. Well, <laughs> you know, and this is, then again, we're talking about change and shift, right? Right. So everything in my healing program, 10 or 20 or 30 years ago, for sure, would have been considered unconventional. Now... Right like aloe vera, for example. Mm. Aloe vera now is, I don't know, I I think it's kind of becoming conventional, would you say? Yeah, and even something, well, maybe just because the circles I'm running in, but bone broth, I think before used to be, no one had ever heard of it, and now it's suddenly becoming more trendy. 
Yeah. And now people are actually looking at the research on gelatin and how that repairs the gut lining and how they used it during wartime to when there was no food, but all you needed was a little piece of bone and you just boil that thing in water and you can actually stay alive on it. You know, like there's all of this research that's come out. So um, I'd say pretty much everything in my protocols were at one time considered unconventional, (laughs) but as people are shifting and becoming more aware that, you know, drug therapy does not lead to healing and wholeness. It can be a stopgap measure. Mm -hmm. It can be a feedback loop interrupter because the body can get in feedback loops, right? Like allergic reaction is a classic. Mm -hmm. And then it just kind of goes worse and worse and your allergies get bigger and bigger. And you put, you throw a drug in there and it goes stop. And your body goes, what? Oh, okay. Right. I don't need to be scared of that. I don't. And then you Mm -hmm. follow in with the natural substances to bring about the true healing and balancing in your body. You go into the mind body connection to say, why do I not feel safe? Why Mm. is my body not feeling that my world is a safe place? Mm. And then you address the healing at those levels where you're no longer going to need the drug for one thing. The drug may have been really useful to just kind of put a stop in there and get you out of that feedback loop so you can then pursue true healing. And that's where I see drugs as, you know, where they can be useful, but the collateral damage caused by any drug on the market from aspirin to antihistamines to Remicade to prednisone, the collateral damage is huge and often worse than the original symptom you were using to address it. So I'm totally against long-term drug use because just mm-hmm. cause I don't see that it does any good and it mm-hmm. does a lot of downstream damage that you then need to heal in addition to your original you know, <laughs> issue. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah. So there's, you know, things like that, like aloe vera, cod liver oil, the bone broth, slippery elm, marshmallow root. Um, We use deglycerizinated licorice so it doesn't increase the blood pressure. Comfrey, that's a controversial herb. A lot of people are afraid of comfrey. I think the FDA kind of went after it and made it scary for people, which is like crap. But we use comfrey. (laughs) Yeah, we use comfrey topically, rectally, and orally. And it's an amazing substance for wound healing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's some of those that I guess would still be considered unconventional. And then all of the, you know, your immune system, your boosting herbs, like your ashwagandha and astragalus and um, all of the mushrooms, the maitake, shiitake, reiki, not Reiki, Reishi. <laughs> Although Reiki is really good too. <laughs> I love Reiki as well. Yeah. And what types of people have you seen come through your, I mean, you have, you're, you're juggling um, at least three different businesses, but in the, in your original initial business, listen to your gut. What types of people have you seen come through? Uh, what things have they healed themselves of, of with your protocols and your books? Well, we offer help specifically to people with Crohn's, colitis, diverticulitis, and irritable bowel syndrome. So within that, of course, there's all the micro conditions like SIBO, the bacterial overgrowth, there's C. difficile infection, there's candida infection, and those people, we get a lot of them as well. But for the people with, say, advanced Crohn's or colitis or diverticulitis, um, there's not a lot of protocols, natural protocols available to help them. But again, like, so we're like a a sub-niche of a sub-niche, because not only do you, you have inflammatory bowel disease, and then you have colitis. Mm -hmm. And then you have people with colitis who are interested in natural healing. Like we're, we're several niches levels down. Right. Right. And that's why I give so much away for free, because if you're not ready to walk this pathway, there's no point because the supplements are expensive. Yeah. You know, and you have to pay for, there's no insurance. It's all out of pocket. So if you're not really ready to put in the time and the effort required, there's no point in wasting your money until you are. So I make that really clear on my websites and I give a ton of stuff for free so people can self-select themselves. And I'm totally upfront about that. I'm like, it's, this is your journey. It's whatever your gut is telling you, whatever you're ready for. So I'll get emails from people and they'll be like, okay, I've been following you for two years. I'm finally ready. Wow. 
that's awesome. Because wow. if you tried to come and do this earlier, maybe you wouldn't have succeeded. Right, right. Or we get the flip side. We get people who are, they really want to do all the physical natural protocols. So they want to take all the supplements and do the retention enemas and do the craniosacral and the body work, but they won't go into their mind, body, spiritual mm. interface. And they stop there mm. because maybe they're living in a relationship that erodes their health on a daily basis. And they're not willing to look at that. Right. Maybe their family of origin, you know, is ill, right? And then they spend time with those people and their energy oppresses them. But they've been in that family matrix, whether it's by birth or a chosen family for so long that they don't see how they could possibly shift that. And to shift, it would require too much change, too much new things. And they're just, they're not willing. And so they stop there so they can get off all their drugs and they can manage the cycle of their disease using natural methods. But true healing Mm -hmm. where you are vibrant and energized and full of vitality, you have to go all the way into the jungle. You have to face all the <laughs> darkness and you have to, you know, step by step, you don't have to do it all at once, mm -hmm. but you kind of have to go there and do whatever you can to unravel those pieces. Just as a side note, let's talk about the jungle. Tell me about the jungle, like in your experience, whether it's in your life or what you've seen other people, like how to encourage people to go into the jungle? Because that can be kind of scary. It is. And I, I think, you know, it's sad to say, but for most people to go in there, they have to be forced. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> really, I mean, I wouldn't have. I mean, some of the things that I've had to go through and, and face, I would not have gone there if my body had not forced me. Mm -hmm. So I had a really difficult relationship with my father, a very karmic relationship. And I had been completely symptom-free and doing awesome for like two years. And then we drove up to meet him for lunch. And I walked into the restaurant and I looked in his eyes and I went, mm. and I had to excuse myself and go to the toilet and blood poured from my rectum. Yeah. So I went from being completely healthy with no symptoms for two full years to a, basically a hemorrhage wow. in the space of five minutes. Wow. That's how our mind body links. That's how my, so my mom at the time, my mom is still a Christian after the lunch. Cause she, she's also, but she's, she's a very spiritually gifted person, regardless of which box she's in, um, she could feel what was happening. Like there was so much happening energetically, spiritually during that lunch. And at the end of the lunch, she just turned to me and she said, you have to go find him. She meant in a past life. And I'm like, you're a Christian. You don't even believe in past lives. And she's like, I know, but you, you must, you must go. For, she's British. You must go find him. You must go there. And I was like, yeah, I know. I kind of got that message when the blood poured out of me, like I turned on a faucet. So, you know, the body, and, and this is, you know, this is an Aboriginal belief from Australia mm -hmm. that the Aboriginals say the higher self tries to get us messages as to mm -hmm. what we need to do and how we need to grow and develop. And I think the point of all this growth and development is to be able to live more fully in joy and freedom. Mm -hmm. I don't subscribe to this classroom theory of life on earth. We're here to learn. We're here to learn more. I'm like, that sounds too small. That sounds really human mm -hmm. and really Calvinist to me. I, and so from my experiences over the year, the years, what I've come to my position. And a lot of this teaching has come through the animals as well. Mm -hmm. is, I think we're here to learn how to embody pure joy because joy in, encompasses peace and love and freedom. And it encompasses all those things that I think of when I think of divine source energy. And so how do we move closer and closer to just naturally being and existing in that state of joy and freedom through every cell of our body, through every interaction that we have with people in our environment. And, and so I think that's the purpose of when the higher self is communicating to you, saying, you need to look at this, you need to heal this. It is to move us closer and closer to that place of joy.
Mm -hmm. right? It is for our highest good. And so the Aboriginals in Australia, they say the higher self tries to get you a message in numerous different ways. If you don't listen, you continue to not listen as the, the higher self is forced to use the body to message you. Because the body, if it gets bad enough, you cannot ignore it. Right. Because it's like, well, now you have a broken leg. You can no longer walk. Are you going to listen now? Or now you're hemorrhaging from your intestines. You're going to be <laughs> dead in 24 hours. Are you going to listen now? Are you finally <laughs> going to do the needful, as my Indian programmer says? <laughs> I will do the needful. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's the way that, you know, illness is used or for some people, it's a life crisis, right? It's the breakup right. of, of a marriage that absolutely devastates you and takes you into the pit of hell. Um, for other people, it's the death of mm. either a beloved pet or a human, like, because they're all just beings. I don't see a distinction between a dog, a horse, a human. For me, they're all just beings. And that that heart and soul connection can be just as strong no matter what form the being takes. So these are all the kinds of things that force us to move deeply, to move into the perceived darkness, because within the darkness is actually the light. And that's what our higher self is trying to move us to, right? <laughs> it's trying right. to move from this view of, of life as black and white and light and darkness to going, actually, it's just a rainbow of colors everything is a color. And if we can see life like that, instead of saying, well, this is a struggle and this is happiness, how about we just see it? Well, this is yellow and this is blue. That's mm -hmm. what I'm trying to get to in my life. I'm not there yet. Because I kind of <laughs> see, see that in animals. Again, animals are such teachers for me. Like you don't really see a dog making a judgment about good or bad, do you? No, no, no. Right? Like they just have a greater wisdom than us. They just, they just be. They are just in mindful beingness, no matter what's happening. They're not putting a judgment of good or bad. They're just existing. They're just being, and they're staying open in that moment. And so that's what I'm, you know, I'm gradually learning to do and moving closer and closer to that rainbow mm -hmm. paradigm of life. And is there any way that you could say that running or having your own business has either showed you more colors of the rainbow or taken you into some sort of jungle or and or given you a sense of freedom that you never thought possible. Absolutely. Like, Absolutely. And, mm -hmm. I, I, for me, I don't think I could, uh, I mean, I started my first business when I was nine years old. <laughs> <laughs> we ran a candy store. We looked around and we were like, <laughs> we live out in the country. It's half an hour car drive to any candy store. And, you know, summers are like three to four months off school. Right. So my brother and I, my uncle owned a drugstore. So we said, will you sell us the candy at wholesale? He goes, well, wholesale plus 20% because I got to make a profit. <laughs> like, okay. And so we built out of scrap wood, this little candy store at the end of our driveway. And we were kids. So we knew what kids liked. And we like, we sold out. We had to hire the next door neighbor. We had like, oh yeah, kids would ride their bikes for miles around because they could actually get to this candy store without their parents driving them. <laughs> so that's kind of like, you know, my, and, and, you know, I, my Indian family, the Patels, we're known Patels own their own business. That's how they roll. We don't, my dad's motto was, why the hell would you work your ass off to put money in someone else's pocket when you can put it in your own? So <laughs> that's kind of like what I grew up with this orientation of, yeah, why would I want to give all my time and energy and talent, my life force energy away to someone else? when I could put it into my thing. So um, that's kind of where I've automatically been oriented. And then the other thing that I don't think I could live without if I had a job, or I would have to work for someone like me, because you know my team, and here's how we do things differently. So my mm -hmm. team, we don't have any employees. Mm -hmm. Every single person, but we're a team. Right. But we say to every single person, you own your own business we will contract you. So now that takes that person out of mummy child, daddy child relationship and puts us here. You own your business. I own my business. We're going to work together. Right. And we're going to be part of this bigger whole because we have a common goal. Right. Our common goal is to bring healing and hope to all these 
hundreds and thousands of people who are undergoing unimaginable suffering. And so that's what unites us. And so then it's interesting. And, and, and I kind of want to film this at some point. I want to send my camera guy around to our team who's, mm -hmm. you know, in the States, the Philippines, Europe, India, like we have people everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. as, as I'm sure you do. And, and film them and go, how do you feel about this? Because what I think they feel, they, they're not employees, but they're also not like, I'm totally independent. I don't need, like, we're really connected. There's a real team there. So a lot of our people have been with us for 10 years, wow. right? There's no staff turnover because there's no staff. It's like, you're here because you want to be here because you're all in because you don't get this kind of job satisfaction, business satisfaction anywhere else. Right. And then for us, because we're like on the hub sitting over here, if we have a really good year, we just shoot them bonus money. We don't tell them. We just say, you have shares, so you're justified to get this amount. We just, we just fricking drop money on them because why <laughs> wouldn't we? Right? Like, this is what abundance is about. Right. If you're in a team and these people are having abundance, but these people aren't, well, you're not a team, are you? Right. So that's part of keeping this. So this whole concept or way of being in your life I think, again, is part of that move to that embodiment of joy and freedom through all the levels. You don't go, well, I have joy and freedom when I'm at home or after work. Like, mm -hmm. what, what is that? That's trying to, that's, that's, that's like segmenting your mind from your body. You can't, that actually doesn't work. We are here for the wholeness, for the integration, right? So if you have a huge chunk of your life where you don't have joy and freedom, mm -hmm. that is going to bleed and this is what we'll often see people come in with. They're in a job that is mm. making them sick. Mm. Like you, you can never fully heal until you heal this piece. And why mm. do you have a belief that money has to flow from hard goddamn work? Why do you have a belief that you must <laughs> suffer to make money, right? So then we're back into that mind-body interface. Right. So for me personally, what I need to be a thriving, vital human being is I need to not have a schedule. Mm. I need to work when I want to work mm -hmm. and I need to play when I want to play. And for me, those terms have disappeared. There is no work and play for me. Mm -hmm. right. I have, I have three businesses, three kids, 15 animals. <laughs> my, my life is the whole, and it all flows. And then mm -hmm. a really interesting thing happens because the horses, I thought, okay, I'm just going to have my horse stuff and I'm never going to monetize that because that's just, that's my freedom. That's my gifting to myself and blah, blah, blah. Well, guess what's happened? <laughs> you know, like uh, now the horse business is like a try. And so I'm like, I have to make this a business now. I have to, because, <laughs> because people are demanding it. People right. are asking to buy things. People right. are, because when money is just an energy, right? Right. It's like, I want some of what you have. So I'm going to give you some of what I have. Mm -hmm. Then your whole life just gets to be that integration, that holistic experience. So there's no work and play in my life. There's ebb and flow. Mm -hmm. So like this morning, I was like, I really don't want to get out of bed. And I didn't have anything scheduled that I had to, except for this call, which is late in the day. So I was right. like, perfect. I'm not getting <laughs> out of bed. I, go, oh, I got to get out because, you know, there's emails waiting for me and there's probably some people who need screw that. I'm staying in bed because I can, because my life works on ebb and flow. And right now I need to ebb. I need to just drift in and out of the dream time and, you know, mm -hmm. snuggle and enjoy my linen duvet cover. <laughs> because I had enough money to buy that and I'm going to really enjoy it now. And, you know, stuff like that. So mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of the way that I view things. And so the people who come into my world and that I exchange money with, I've kind of set it up so they get to work and live that way too. So we get pictures, we get pictures from, there's two of our team that are in, in the Philippines and they're, they're on their laptops at this beautiful glass top table overlooking a swimming pool <laughs> with palm trees. And they're like, just another day at the office. And I'm like, I hate you. Why are you in palm trees on the swimming pool? And I'm in like Vancouver, BC with rain outside my window. But, you know, and people go, oh, third world workers. No, 
we pay them a fraction of what we pay someone here but we're paying them an upper middle class wage. Mm -hmm. So they are able to bring their entire family out of poverty, send their siblings to school. And then we just drop bonus checks on them from time to time. They're like, we've won the lottery. But for us as a business, and so again, we're back to this holistic concept, right? Of, well, we don't have to, we can have this amazingly vibrant, alive, helpful, enthusiastic team and we don't have to hamper the growth of our gift because we can't afford to hire locally. We hire where we, where the people are who can do what is needed to be done because we wouldn't sacrifice quality at the right. same time, right? right? right. right. Um, so again, it's just this whole new positioning on things. And then, of course, there's other roles in our business where, where we're like, I really need a native English speaker or I need someone who's in the same time zone as me because I need to Skype. It's a little more complex. Right. But guess what? The business can afford to pay those people too because we haven't, do you know what I'm saying? So it's right. all more this, like, it, there's just a lot more fluidity, a lot more flow, a lot more giving yourself permission to just kind of show up with all your magnificence of, of all, like, like a horse, right? And you've seen my horses. Are they mm-hmm. not magnificent? They're magnificent. And they don't apologize for that. They don't try to hide. Well, Jeannie's here and she's really slow and tiny. So I better make myself a little slower and small. <laughs> feel bad. Like, they're like, yo, look at me. I'm the bomb. And they just like, they just, and then the, the wheat that feeds into us and we go, oh, this lifts me up. This makes me mm-hmm. feel amazing because you're, you're standing in the power of your brilliance and magnificence. And, right. and I get to be a part of that. Right. Even though I can never do what you can do, it doesn't matter because right. I'm owning my unique person and, and what I can do. Right. So what's, what's, what's the most freedom and joy I can manifest in my life, in my being, in my body, with my current energy levels? And I'm going to open to that. I'm just going to be open. What's the most freedom and joy I can manifest in my body with my current energy levels? I love that. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that there was a, I was looking on your website today and I saw a quote, it's an Albert Einstein quote that says, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind is a faithful servant. We have created a society that follows the servant and has forgotten the gift. And I know in, in my life and in my business, it's been a, a huge evolution of really learning to trust those golden threads and trust those little ideas and inner voice, uh, inner voicings that I hear. And I wondered if you could talk about that, because I think I see that as a huge theme running in all three of your businesses that you, mm-hmm. you really follow what you're interested in or, or what you hear someone asking about, and then that takes you down the next step. And just if you could talk a little bit about how you've paved this really unique lifestyle for yourself. Mm-hmm. Well, I think the the main thing that feeds into that is I pretty much never have a business plan. I've never in any of the businesses I've started or run done a cash flow plan or analysis because <laughs> all I'd be like, if I actually put this down in black and white, I'm not doing nothing. I'm going to go back to my job or crawl under my covers and not come out because every <laughs> business I've started has been financially unviable if I were mm. to map it out. Wow. So it's that thing of, but again, that has to match your personality. That's mm-hmm. my personality. That's how I roll. I'm a jump off the cliff kind of person. <laughs> I'm a go hard or go home. I'm a, and that's not fake for me. That's my natural state of being. Right. So if you take someone else who um, has to be more planned and is by nature more conservative and they try to do that, they probably will fail because they're not being true to themselves. Mm. So for that person, they may go, okay, what I need to do to be congruent with who I am is I need to start my business on the side and I need to keep my job, but I'm going to change the way I look at my job. I'm going to look at my job and go, you are the investor in my business. Mm. And that perspective shift changes everything. So instead of this being this thing you have to go to, so until you can earn enough money to be over here, you're like, no, you're my investor. Mm. I like you. And you're the one who's funding my passion over here. Now, this may stay a passion. This may stay just a part-time thing because that's where it should be. 
Mm-hmm. And there's nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. Like we just need to have those outlets. We need to find what, again, what is our unique expression of life force energy? And that may be what it is. You have your investor and you have your business passion. And then you go, this feels awesome. Mm-hmm. My life feels brilliant like this, <laughs> right? So you kind, yeah. of, you kind of do that. So that's why I think we need that combination of reason, research, rational thinking with intuition, but I would say kind of giving the intuition precedence. But you don't forget this, because that's the other thing that you see a lot, especially if you move in spiritual and new agey circles, people have done the reverse and they've gone, it's <laughs> all about intuition and who cares about all this stuff, but then they, they don't know why they can never get above the break even point or the mm-hmm. they can never get to actual wealth. Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. because we are not just spirits, we are incarnated. <laughs> we chose to embody for a purpose. So saying I this is just the thing my true self walks around in is a disservice <laughs> and mm-hmm. and it will cripple you and you will probably develop illness if you have that approach to your body. If you see, I chose this body because this body is the densest part of my soul and I'm here for that integration, that changes everything. And it brings you into that deeper partnership with your body, with the flesh and blood, with the, and you can, people say, well, this is a lower vibration. This is a lower resonance. (laughs) No, then why didn't you just stay in the spirit world (laughs) or kill yourself? Boom. You're back there. Problem solved. No, (laughs) because then, then nothing makes sense, right? Why did you incarnate and why in this form, why in this body, right? That's where your gold is. That's where your enlightenment, your, your abundance is going to come from, is bringing that integration of the two together. And that's where true healing comes from. So I see that as kind of another representation of this rational versus intuitive positioning. It's not about an either or. Mm-hmm. It's about bringing it together. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, understanding that the divine life force energy sits over all. And your intuition is really a direct line to that. So even though your rational mind may be saying, well, I don't quite have enough research or I'm feeling a lot of fear, Mm -hmm. that's okay. Honor that. Thank the fear. It it does a really good job for us. But go with your intuition above all else. But take care of the other parts too. So if you're you're feeling a lot of fear, say, okay, well, I'm going to go get you some more research. Uh, But I'm not going to look in these areas where everyone's negative. I'm going to look over here where people like Katie have followed and built successful businesses. And and I'm going to take her story and plug that in to my rational self. And I'm going to use that. So that's kind of what I see as being the ideal. Mm, I love that. And and how has your intuition led you into working more and more with horses? I mean, that... That really took me by surprise. I had always known you as being really into health and wellness and pouring over all the amazing blog articles you do from everything from, you know, cell phone radiation to all different kinds of ways to take care of your health, not just digestive issues. And then sort of seemingly for me, out of left field, here you came galloping along with these horses. (laughs) Well, the, the what happened is um, I grew up with horses. Mm-hmm. So when I was in, I was born in Kenya. And from literally the time I could talk, I was asking my mom to ride a horse. So my mom would take me to the stand. I was two years old. And I would just, I would just sit on my pony and the guy would lead me around <laughs> in circles, but I would not, mi- I would have to have a raging fever to miss that ride. It was oh. so important to me. And then we moved to Canada. And so from the age of seven, I started asking my dad. I'd ask him every day when he was in the shower so he couldn't get <laughs> out of me. Or I'd open the shower door. I'd go, Dad, can I have a horse? No. Like, <laughs> Dad, can I have a horse? No. And I, I, just, I was like, I'm not giving up. So after a full year of this, <laughs> he finally, and he sets me a trial. For some reason, he, he chose a bunny. He's like, well, you show you can take care of a bunny. I'm like, what's a bunny with a horse? But that's what he picked <laughs> my dad. I took care of this darn bunny for like <laughs> almost a year. And then he finally got me my horse when I was eight. 
And I chose my first horse and I chose based on looks and that was a disaster. So my, <laughs> we just didn't get rehome that horse. And my parents knew nothing about horses. Like nobody mm. knew anything about horses. Really? No. Yeah. And, and weren't interested. Like my mom, my dad was away at work all the time and my mom was just barely able to cope with her life and three kids as it was. And so then when we got rid of that horse, cause he was just like, I mean, he's actually dangerous. We were looking for another one. And I was like, and so we went to this farm and there was this beautiful Palomino with golden coat and flax and mane. And I was like, oh, a Palomino. But then there was this like boring old gray white horse and she was pregnant. And my mom was like, that's the one. Because my mom was like, I can tell if the horse is going to throw me and this horse would never throw me. So this, mm. And I thought, you know what? I picked the last time. Again, I picked from my mind. I mm-hmm. didn't pick from my spirit. Mm-hmm. But my mom was like, I don't care what the horse looks like. I care what the horse feels like. So I decided to trust my mom. And we got this horse and she was in foal. And I, le- I had one book called Your First Horse. <laughs> so, I, so my horse was like, my horse was actually my teacher. Wow. So she taught me, and because I was a kid, I wasn't coming from a dominance position much. I mean, I had, I had certain amount of dominance, but you put an adult with a horse and the adult feels the need to really make that horse listen and obey and teach him who's boss and don't let him get away with it. And all this crap that we do with horses when we're adults, but because I was a child, this horse was my teacher and she was actually, um, like a spiritual guide who incarnated in horse form to get me through my childhood, which was very, a very difficult struggle because of that karmic relationship with my dad. I don't know if I would have made it through without her. So yeah, she literally saved my life. And so that's, but then I started university. I was leaving when I, when it was dark, I was coming home when it was dark. She was like, uh, hello, I have no life. So she's the one who made me she said, I need to go to a new home where I can be loved and have someone spend time with me. And so I said to her, I said, okay, I'll put an ad in the paper, but if the perfect person doesn't come along, I'm not selling you. Like that's not, so she's fine. So I put the ad in the paper. Of course, the first family that answers the ad has an eight-year-old little girl. I see the connection, like just, zzz, and she looks at me and I'm like, okay, I see that. This is your next little girl that you want to take care of and raise up. And so, yeah. And so we rehomed her there, but we said, of course, if anything, she comes back here. I then couldn't emotionally at that age cope with that. So I just kind of shut off, but my mom stayed in touch with the family. So my horse Dobbin, she raised that little girl up to university. And then she went to the little girl next door and raised her up, wow. at which point she died. And I knew she died because she came and visited me in the dream time. She took me on this ride that was just unbelievable and so crazy. And I knew this, I, I woke up and I said, she's died because she just mm. said goodbye. Wow. Um, that she's left the earth plane. So that was all in my past. And then I was traveling I was having my own children, which because of, you know, my health deficit at that time was extra challenging for me. So I had no energy and time left for horses. And then as soon as my youngest was old enough, I was like, now it's time. I fly to Mexico. My brother's girlfriend walks in. She says, Jeannie, I found your horse. I'm like, what are you talking about? The horse is in New Jersey. I'm like, are you crazy? But, and then that's a whole other story of how that came to be. And turns out that this horse, I had actually painted her five years earlier. Wow. Down to the markings on her nose, like the shading, the shadows, everything. So I was like, wow. That's a done deal. I guess I'm shipping <laughs> 3,000 miles. He's the one. And then she made me go get all the other horses. So it, <laughs> it's been this, again, just a super spiritual journey into this place that's, you know, really my core. It's, it's where I came from. It's kind of the deepest part of me. But now I'm coming at it from a completely different 
angle in space and then going and looking at horse consciousness and how horses are treated in our world and it's really awful like the way that people keep their horses a zoo would not be able to keep an animal of that species in those conditions because wow. zoo standards are you have to provide an animal with you know as close to their natural habitat as you can so you take an animal that ranges 25 to 30 miles a day in continual movement and you stick it in an 8 by 10 stall, maybe with a 10 by 20 foot little cage off the stall mm. and the horse just stands there day after day by itself. That's how most horses are kept. Mm. And so I kind of go, wow, I, I actually kind of have a debt to horse consciousness to, to pay back what my first horse gave me so many years ago. And the way that I can do that is by bearing witness. Because the one thing people say when they see my horses is, I never, I've never seen horses like this. Like my horses are so alive compared to those stabled domestic horses. And they see when people, even through video, people start crying watching the videos because they see the difference. And so mm -hmm. I think that for them is the kickoff to going, what am I doing to my horse? That my horse looks like this mm. and this horse is, <sighs> right? And so I don't have to say anything. I don't have to lecture. I, don't have, I just have to show. I just have to bear witness and let it filter down. What are some of the ways that you treat your horses differently besides the, the space factor and allowing them to move and range? Just like name a couple of things that you do that are different from how other people raise their horses. I give them low sugar hay because horses are not actually grazers. They're technically foragers. In a natural environment, they'll eat 25 to 30 different species of plants a day. So they're not used to just, but most people think of a horse, they think of them out on your lawn eating your grass, right? That's right. not their ideal diet. That's actually way too much sugar for them. Mm -hmm. So the way to get around that in a domestic situation is to buy low sugar hay where the hay has been tested for the sugar levels. Mm -hmm. And then I put that into slow feeders or hay nets, which are, they have either a grate or they're surrounded by a net. So the horse has to kind of pick the hay out using their lips and that slows them down and it mimics the grazing. Mm -hmm. Like people think, oh, my horse will just eat however much it can get. No, because if you put a pile of loose hay next to a hay net or a slow feeder with a grate, the horse will eat out of the difficult places rather than the loose pile. Hmm. The horses, horses eat because not just because they're bored, not just because they love food, but it's their DNA. Horses are built to, they're like cows. They have a massive thousand to 1800 pounds of muscle to maintain. They have to eat all day long on mm -hmm. plant matter, mm -hmm. right? So that's, they're just following how they, and their stomach produces acid 24 hours a day. So if you have a horse that's only fed once or twice or four times a day, but it's producing acid 24 hours a day, yeah, that's why the number one cause of death in horses is colic. Their intestines get ulcerated mm -hmm. and twisted and they die. Mm -hmm. So, And again, if you can provide movement and if you can provide a slow feeder system, that's actually one of my most popular posts on my blog. It's a slow feeder design comparison. So I look at all the different types of slow feeders and the pros and cons of each. So that's one thing that I do. The other thing that I do is I provide different types of footing. Because again, you think of a wild Mustang, they're moving across meadow, rock, gullies, like there's a lot of different terrain that their hooves are moving across, and that's what keeps their hooves strong. Mm -hmm. So another main cause of, of illness in horses in domestic environments is they get lame mm -hmm. because they're just standing on these <laughs> soft, grassy surfaces. Kind of, kind of like all of us at the computer. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Very similar comparison. So I have different types of gravel mm -hmm. surfaces and rocks and stuff. And we've watched the horses. We're actually filming a DVD series on, on natural hoof trimming. And the horses will use those surfaces to wear down their own hooves. Mm -hmm. So then there's left hoof care maintenance, but the hooves are really strong. And, and of course, they have the room to run. They, they don't, they can actually run 
flat out. And then we have a huge forest area with trails and the horses clean up the forest. I, that's something that I had no concept of. They will take a forest that is just covered with underbrush. And I don't, I love to put like security cameras in there to see how they do it. Like, is it simply from them going back and forth? Or are they actually using their hooves and their teeth to lift branches out of the way? Because mm. honest to God, it's like a park ranger team has been in there <laughs> and cleared these pristine trails through the forest. Wow. Yeah. And then sometimes they'll be bolting through the forest and I'll watch them take like a triple jump over just whatever fallen trees and logs. Like our whole concept of, oh, be careful. The horse might break their leg. Like when you let a horse move naturally, they can literally jump over something and come down on an unstable footing of logs and trees and rock and a hole and they're fine. They won't even sprain anything because their body has learned how to, you know, auto correct in motion. Oh my God. I remember when we, when we were in Vancouver, the team and we watched your, so just for the listeners, we sat out in a, in a circle and we were waiting for your horses to come show up to see yeah. what kind of lessons they had for us. And we're waiting and we're waiting and maybe they'll come and maybe they won't. And then suddenly just, it's like this, the galloping is such a beautiful sound. They came running over the, over the hill, through the forest, through the trees and ran around us right up next to us. And it, it's just, wow, you get such a sense of their incredible power yeah. and then spending time with them and having them, you know, nudge us and nuzzle us and nip some of us and, and teach us how to maintain our energy and our boundaries. I wondered what kind of other lessons you've learned through your work with the horses intuitively or what kind of lessons you've seen come through them for other people in this sort of nonverbal communication way. Well, it's, it's really interesting what I've discovered because there's, a, there's an entire field of equine assisted therapy, right? So they use this with, it's very popular with war veterans who suffer from PTSD. It's very um, useful with at risk youth so the people actively use the horse as kind of like a co-counselor or co-therapist because the horse is all about energy and the horse is like a mirror. So whatever energy you're putting out, the horse mirrors back to you. So you may think, I'm really loving and open, but actually you're walled off and scared. The horse is not <laughs> going to be loving and open. The horse is going to be walled off and scared. And you're going to experience what that feels like. Maybe you're going to get frustrated. Why does this horse keep stonewalling me? And then the therapist will say, let's go into how you're feeling right now. And then that's where there'll be a, a huge process or learning because the horse mirrors you back mm. to yourself. But you can trust that mirroring. Because it's not a human with their manky shit and all their agenda in there. <laughs> this is a pure being. It has no agenda. It has no higher ul ul ulterior motive, right? It's just being who it is. So there's a whole level of trust, you know, transference and projecting and all those human things don't exist with a horse. But again, the horse itself needs to be in an empowered state. Mm -hmm. And so this is the thing that I do see with certain, as equine therapy becomes more popular, people are keeping horses in stable, unnatural environments because they want to get their eight clients a day and then saying that the horse is this reliable, maybe for a little bit of time, but then you're going to get a horse that's resentful, bitter, shut down, in pain. So there's a whole, you know, it's like anything when we humans get involved, we kind of... We can really complicate things, but um, <laughs> yeah. So there's the mirroring aspect. And then what I've discovered too, because I don't do equine therapy professionally and I, I don't want to, but I just do it with my friends and my family who are struggling with something. So I'll say to them, well, what I've discovered is as we're driving out to the barn, set your intention for what you would like more information about, right? Mm -hmm. So I had someone come out and um, she had this brain fog like to a really extreme degree and nothing and they were you know doctors had said this and they said that but she couldn't figure out what it was and so she said I'd like more information and then sometimes it would turn into really bad headaches and she's like I'd like more information on that mm -hmm. and so when we got there the horses were waiting that's the other thing I found like they because they're herd consciousness and they'll often tag team bet between each other so they were waiting they had a whole plan for her <laughs> from the minute we arrived 
And it was so interesting to me because they, they went straight to her root chakra and they were like open here and they went head root, head root. And I said, I said, well, what they're asking you to do is to open the chakras so you can drain out your root chakra. So get your energy and flow and get it draining. And then for everything else that they were doing, it's like every couple of minutes, they would go back to her root chakra. I said, they're reminding you to drain, keep draining, because she would get distracted with whatever. But they were like, no, you must keep this drain going. Like you're so backed up. You need to get in flow and you need to drain that out. And then they, if I didn't know them so well by this point, I, I don't think I would have been able to allow this to happen. But they started putting her in really dangerous situations. Hmm. And I was like, oh, what are you doing? And they were like, and and so like at one point two of the young ones were rearing up Ooh. and biting wrestling like oh my god right on either side of her <gasps> now oh a god. normal person <laughs> would run for the hills right, right? like if you right. have two thousand oh, yeah. pound creatures you get the hell out of there oh yeah she stood there without moving she's like this and i was like how are you feeling right now she's like um, I feel a little unsafe. I'm like, a little unsafe? And then I realized what they were trying to show me. This person is not in her body and she mm. needs to get in here right now. Because mm. where she is, is an extremely dangerous place to exist. And so they hammered her They for an hour. And I was like, guys, this is too much. And they were like, no, she must come fully into her body. She wow. cannot remain in this state any longer. And then afterwards, because in the minute you're kind of processing. So, and then they would tell me things. They would say, tell her this or go get this. And so I kind of, like you said, I do that little translator role as they direct me to. And it wasn't until the end and things had calmed down, I realized, oh, this makes total sense because this person had been, had been basically she'd gone out with and conceived a child with a man who was later convicted for running a pedophilia thing on Facebook, <laughs> like a total dangerous predator. And she had no idea. Why? Because she's not home. She's not in there. And that's what the horses were communicating. She must not walk away from here without getting into her body because it is so unsafe. Wow. So they didn't know that story. They didn't know anything. And I was like, that answers the question of how someone can be so taken in by such a dangerous person, carrying such dangerous energies and have no idea. Because look at her. Look what she's doing now. She's like, um, I don't really feel safe. I feel a bit nervous. Really? You should, be, you should be either fainted unconscious by now or you should be like 10 miles away because you're running so hard. You're just not even looking behind you. That's what a normal person. And, and so right. it's just fascinating to me the level at which they know and they kind of know what's most important for that person. They're like, well, your head is one thing, but the real problem here <laughs> is that you're not home. There's nobody in here and you need to get in here right now. And we're going to make sure we're going to make sure you get in there by yeah. making you so viscerally afraid you actually inhabit your body so you can move, wow. right? Because she just stand there frozen. So how do you take someone like that and get them to live and then move, move, mm -hmm. move so that their response to danger is move, not freeze and become right. a victim. Right. Yeah. So things wow. like that. Yeah. Just fascinating. And where do you think you're, do you have any inkling of where this is going next or you just take it day by day at a time in terms of where, where your trajectory is going? Yeah, it's total. And you know, I, I can't even project because I'll probably screw it up. I'll probably like get in their way. So, and, you know, along with what they're teaching everyone else, they're teaching me at least that much for myself, right? Mm -hmm. And my own family, like they have given me and all of those, lo those lessons are on my blog. They're on listen to your horse.com. So, cause I, I tell them, I'm like, uh, people are going to think I'm absolutely crazy. <laughs> Because you know what? This is what happened. I'm going to tell the story. <laughs> so you know, my latest, my latest is a two part thing. It's called "In the Jaws of a Horse." Because my one mm -hmm. horse did something so off the charts, insane to me, and there was like 
this other person, he was like, oh yeah, I do black magic ceremonies. I'm like, what? Like the, the horse is new. And they were like, he has to get out of here. He has to leave right now. And so we're going to, so the whole thing is just kind of, you know, turns into this crazy ass story. Like, <laughs> can even believe this. And I'm like, and who cares? I'm telling the story. I don't care. I'm throwing it out it. there. I love and then, it. of course, funnily enough, people are, yeah, yeah, they're blown away, but they're also like, this is opening me. This is expanding mm. me. This is resonating with me. And so, you know, that whole thing of you just put your truest self out there in the world and your tribe will find you. Right. And they have, like I have, you know, 1400 subscribers to the blog now, the YouTube channel, has I think I'm coming up on 700 six or 700 subscribers there for like this totally fringe as one person called me whack job way out there <laughs> and then and the people who are responding are from all over the world going oh my god I thought I was the only one who felt this way about mm -hmm. horses or who had mm -hmm. this relationship with my horses I can't believe I found you I can't believe there are others mm. and so that's kind of the community that the horses are creating around this it's very magical Oh, it's such an inspiration to know even, you know, for anyone listening out there, for whatever you're into. Yes. That, I mean, for what you're into, Jeannie, someone could consider you a whack job for having all oh, of yeah. these stories, but you have such a huge following already for in doing this such a short period of time. And I think it's because I'm not interested in convincing anyone. Right. Like I'm totally happy for you to read my blog and go, she tells the best stories and have them <laughs> just be stories. I right. really have no attachment to what, meaning people assign to that. I know the meaning that I assign to it. I know what it means to me and how it moves me forward in my life and the rest, I don't care. Check it out or go, this person is like seriously mental. They should be in an institution. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> You're entitled to your opinion. No problem there. <laughs> and on the note of the stories, if you want to read more about Jeannie's horse stories, her website is listen to your horse.com. If you want to know about her fabulous business program. I've seen the workbooks of it and it's absolutely incredible. Um, it's called listen to your freedom.com and the website for the health and wellness and healing digestive issues is listen to your gut.com. So I just want to thank you so much for spending all this time with us, Jeannie. Oh, really, thanks really Katie. Appreciate your wisdom. You, you ask awesome questions. So it's, it's easy to have a great conversation. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. And thanks for all the work that you've done. And my horses love your flower essences too. Aww. I put, I put the infinite love one before I go mm -hmm. to the barn mm -hmm. and Odie comes over and puts Aww. her, her muzzle right here Aww. and just stands there and breathes for a few moments Aww. every time. So I just got to get my fix. The infinite I love her. I love her. She's such a great horse. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to The Flower Lounge. I'm Katie Hess, and we'll be releasing a new podcast every Wednesday. If you like what you heard or you know someone who might be touched by our conversation, share it with them. And don't forget to subscribe. To find out what your favorite flowers mean about you, take the quiz at lotusway.com.